You're listening ad-free on Wondery Plus. A listener note, this episode contains adult content and is not suitable for everyone. Please be advised. I have a confession. Until recently, I had never looked at the social media platform TikTok. I thought it was just dance videos and funny pets. However, a few months ago, I saw a 2020 special about these TikTokers that were determined to free the Menendez brothers. I was flabbergasted. How do these young people have any idea who these guys are? They weren't even born in 1989. That's when the Menendez brothers, Eric and Lyle, were charged with murdering their parents in Beverly Hills, California. Their videos had started out as anthems to the brothers, talking about how hot they were and showing pictures of the brothers when they were young. The videos then evolved into a social movement, a movement to get the Menendez brothers a new trial. I gotta hand it to them, they seem to have done their homework. Apparently, they spent hours watching old court TV footage, the stuff I watched live in 1993 when the trial took place. So why'd they take up this cause now and with such passion? Well, from what I was seeing on social media, apparently they felt like they could relate to the abuse the Menendez brothers reportedly suffered at the hands of their parents, Jose and Kitty, and how they struggled with years of abuse in their home. Back then, the abuse didn't track for me. I remember thinking to myself, well, that's convenient. It's been four years. Why didn't it come out until now? But with this case sparking the curiosity of a new generation, I felt compelled to take a new look at the Menendez brothers. The trial was in the early 90s, and our thoughts and studies on abuse have come a long way since then. This new information was making me rethink my opinion. But as I searched through the case, questions kept popping up. What could have made these boys who seemingly had everything so angry that they would kill their parents in such a horrific manner? Did they really feel like they had no other options? Was it all about the money or were they truly terrified and just snapped? From Wondery and Treefort, I'm Candace DeLong and this is Killer Psyche. I'm a retired FBI criminal profiler and psychiatric nurse. I've been studying people's minds for more than five decades. When someone does something horrifying or even criminal, we ask ourselves why. What were they thinking? But we rarely get a satisfying answer. I'm diving deep into the mindsets of all kinds of criminals and others whose disturbing behavior landed them in the news. We are going beyond the headlines in this series, and I'll give you my best analysis of what made them do what they did. This episode is the Menendez Brothers. I was still living in Chicago in 1993 when this trial dominated cable news. Nearly every news outlet painted a picture of two boys, spoiled brats who murdered their parents for money. The night of the killings, Jose and Kitty Menendez fell asleep watching a James Bond movie in the living room of their Beverly Hills mansion. Their sons, Lyle, 18, and Eric, 21, entered the room and shot Jose in the back of the head. Awakened by the blast, Kitty got off the sofa. They shot her in the leg. She tried to crawl to the door to escape. The boys went out to their car, got more ammo, went back in, reloaded the shotgun, and shot her again in the leg chest, and the face, leaving her unrecognizable. Originally, those facts bothered me the most. But once you get past the horror, you can see that they thought they had to kill her. Police and prosecutors thought the motive for this murder was greed. They wanted their money. If Kitty was left alive, she would have gotten the money, not them. 
and they would have gone to prison for the rest of their lives because their mother witnessed the murder of her husband. Killing one's parents, plural, is known as parasite. It is very rare. I'm aware of many cases where kids living in the house killed a parent, but not both. In fact, there are less than 50 known cases in the last 100 years where someone kills both parents. I heard a fascinating quote on one of the documentaries I watched. Kill one parent, and that's a bad seed. Kill both parents, that's a bad family. So that made me ask, what was going on in that Beverly Hills mansion? As with so many murders, to find the motive, we have to dig into the background of the killers, learn what the home environment was. So let's take a look at the family. Jose immigrated from Cuba and worked his way up from dishwasher to a wealthy movie executive. Kitty was a former beauty queen who loved the lavish lifestyle. She had aspirations of being an actress, but after having the boys, that dream was gone for her. After the family's big move from New Jersey, she settled into the moneyed and image-conscious lifestyle of Beverly Hills. Lyle and Eric were average students at Beverly Hills High, but very competitive tennis players, which their father really pushed. From the outside, the family appeared to personify wealth and privilege. So when the boys became the prime suspects, it was assumed their motive was simply greed. The public heard a lot about the boys' spending habits. They went through $700,000 in only six months, took lavish trips overseas, and hired a full-time tennis coach. They bought everything from a Rolex to a Porsche, even a restaurant. When their family members defended them by explaining that there was no change in their spending habits from before the murders, that this was their normal pattern, The portrait of the boys as being rich, spoiled brats was firmly solidified in the public consciousness. Then, reports of prior arrests, including a burglary ring with friends, hit the news. Back when the boys were arrested for the burglaries, Jose's take on it was, how could you be so stupid to get caught? You are sheep. You are followers. You are not leaders. He also went to the owners of every home that was burglarized and wrote them a check for everything that was taken. It would not surprise me if he did that so the owners would drop any charges against the boys. Jose bought his sons out of a major felony. What kind of message does that send to kids? Don't get caught, not don't do the crime. And that money can solve any problem. But breaking and entering, though very serious, is not a predictor of parasite. Jose was known to be extremely difficult to deal with, and he was not well-liked. His co-workers spoke about their lack of surprise at his death. Not that someone killed him, but what took so long. And one co-worker said he was actually gleeful. That's very telling because most of us live by the expression, don't speak ill of the dead. But Jose was so hated that his co-workers couldn't help themselves. The boys' coaches, other family members, all said that Jose was not a nice guy, that he was abusive mentally and physically to the boys. The boys had professional tennis coaches, and if they didn't do what Jose wanted them to do, he fired them. One coach said to Jose, how about this? You be the dad, I'll be the coach. And boom, Jose fired him. The pressure he placed on his kids to win at tennis was noted by other parents and kids. He would give hand signals to his kids while they were playing. He'd do that from the bleachers. One time, Eric pushed back and said, I don't want to cheat, and he lost. Reportedly, Eric was punished severely. Jose was so domineering and controlling, he made Lyle wear a toupee because he didn't like the fact that one of his sons was losing his hair. Eric claimed that Jose hit Kitty, and not surprisingly, Kitty had her struggles. According to family members, she had an explosive temper. She abused alcohol, prescription medication, and she told a friend she didn't want kids and frequently repeated that statement. 
One time, she was hospitalized for an overdose of opioids. The boys say that this was not her first or last time trying to kill herself. When Kitty discovered that Jose was having several affairs, it drove her further into a state of deep depression. But according to a close friend, she loved Jose and never considered leaving. She wanted the marriage to work. Having a college degree is part of the American dream, and acquiring the dream is what Jose was all about. Jose wanted his sons to go to top universities. He wanted Lyle to go to Princeton, but Lyle was a mediocre student and did not have the grades or test scores. So Jose gets on a plane and flies to Princeton and gives them a $50,000 donation. And what do you know, Lyle was admitted. Eric was finishing up at Beverly Hills High School. He was to go to UCLA the next year at his father's insistence. Eric did not want to go to college. He wanted to become a professional tennis player, but his dad would have none of that. Lyle flew home to celebrate Eric's graduation from high school. Some say that Lyle was flunking out and had gotten into trouble with the law in New Jersey. This is where different versions of the boys come into play. Eric told his brother that their father was sexually abusing him and had been doing so for a long time. When Lyle told Eric that Jose had abused him also, the boys began to understand the magnitude of the secrets they were keeping in their family. In the weeks leading up to the murders, there are a series of confrontations with the parents. The brothers claim that it's over the abuse. Others claim it is over the parents changing their wills. It seems logical that Kitty and Jose would use the disinheritance as a weapon to keep the boys in line. A close friend of Kitty's went to visit her one day. And when they were talking in the kitchen, Kitty was working on the computer. And Kitty said that she was changing her will. She was upset with the boys, changing her will. And her friend said, Kitty, Lyle's right down the hall. And Kitty said, I don't care. They know I'm not leaving them any money. And that's the testimony of a friend saying, they know I'm not leaving them any money helps to support the motive that this was for greed. The boys claim to be in fear for their lives and two days later bought shotguns to protect themselves. Why did the boys fear for their lives? And why did they go to San Diego to buy the guns? I think because they didn't want to be recognized. They were immature adults, but they were adults. The fact that they purchased the guns two days before the murders speaks to premeditation. This was not a murder where the killer snapped. It is my belief that they knew they were going to kill their parents. They planned to kill their parents. They just didn't plan what to do after they killed their parents. After the murders, the brothers waited to see if the police would come. When they did not, the boys left and tried to come up with an alibi. They hid their guns and bloody clothes under bushes very far away. Figuring that they needed to account for their whereabouts, they went to a movie theater and bought tickets. And then finally, they returned to the house. They assumed that certainly people heard the shots and would call the police and were very surprised to see that the police were not there. So they called the police and reported the murder. Lyle was crying and screaming on the 911 call. The police got there in less than two minutes and believed their hysteria so much, they didn't even test them for gunshot residue that night. The police could not imagine that the brothers could commit such a violent crime against their parents. That doesn't surprise me. Most people think if someone's got a lot of money, they don't have any problems. Originally, the police thought that this was a mob hit. The brothers had shot their parents in the knees to make it appear that way. But the police soon turned their attentions to the brothers. Their behavior was suspicious. Eric was acting strangely and left the country to play tennis after the murders. The boys were spending enormous amounts of money. Eric claimed that spending money was how Lyle coped with stress. But it wasn't long before he too became overwhelmed and was actually thinking of killing himself. He went to a therapist and soon enough told him everything. This was a turning point in the case as this confession was soon turned over to the police. It turns out the therapist was recording the conversations without their consent. 
After the session where Eric confessed, Lyle came to the next meeting and threatened the doctor not to tell, told him, I will kill you if you repeat this. Under California law at the time, a psychotherapist of any kind was forbidden from repeating what their patient told them. However, the confidentiality can be broken if the doctor feels unsafe. When Lyle threatened him, he unknowingly broke the confidentiality barrier. The therapist had a mistress who was also his patient, and he would let her stand outside his door and listen to his sessions. When she listened to the Menendez brothers, she heard everything. Then, when the therapist dumped her, she became angry and reported everything she had heard to the police. That was exactly the break the police needed. They finally had proof that the boys were involved. Until the confession surfaced, the boys had not been prime suspects. The brothers were arrested, and four years later, they were tried in the same courtroom, but each had their own jury. The first trials were shown on court TV and became a phenomenon. The prosecution rested their case, saying the boys did it for greed, The defense then introduced their case and dropped the bombshell that they were severely abused. The juries could not come to a unanimous decision that the boys were guilty of murder. The female jurors voted for manslaughter. The male jurors voted for murder in the first degree. This meant the trial ended in a hung jury. The second trial was very different. They were tried together. There were no cameras allowed in the courtroom. The judge would only allow minimal testimony of abuse. And he excluded most of the abuse details and psychological trauma from the first trial. The judge changed his mind, meaning he reversed himself on a lot of his prior rulings in trial number one. He also did not allow the jury to vote on manslaughter charges instead of murder. It was either murder in the first degree or acquittal. There's a huge difference between murder in the first and manslaughter. Murder in the first is premeditated, deliberate murder, taking someone's life. You knew you were going to do it. You planned it. Manslaughter is the act of killing someone without premeditation. It can be done purposefully or accidentally. And that is the reason the social movement going on now thinks they should get a new trial. They think the jury should have been allowed to consider manslaughter and not just murder in the first degree. The brothers' plight was further compounded by reports that Lyle had told a reporter that he had fooled the jury the first time and he would fool them again. As a result, his lawyers would not let him testify at his second trial because they did not want him to perjure himself. If this is true, it reveals profound narcissism on Lyle. That he felt he could do this and get away with it? Say something like that to a reporter regarding the hottest case in the country? Bragging about bad deeds? Narcissists have no trouble doing that. If I did it, it's okay, so why shouldn't I tell you? Does this cast doubt on Lyle's claim of abuse? I think it does. Can being abused make you a narcissist capable of killing? No. Narcissism is a personality disorder and an individual is born with it. Another explosion in the trial happened after it was revealed that Leslie Abramson, Eric's attorney, had demanded that the prison psychiatrist alter his notes. She was apparently worried that some of the doctor's observations made the boys look bad, made them look guilty. However, the doctor argued to Abramson that he thought his notes proved the boys were abused. This was discovered during the trial, when Abramson's secretary accidentally sent the unedited notes to the prosecutor. The doctor got on the witness stand and revealed that she had asked him to change the notes. In fact, threatened him that if he didn't, she'd take him off the case. Needless to say, this cast a huge shadow on the boy's defense. Was Lyle the spoiled playboy that took advantage of Eric's pain? Was he the ringleader? Could the fear of their parents really have prompted them to seek out guns to protect themselves? Or were they planning on killing them all along?
When you are an FBI agent or any type of law enforcement, you tend to believe the worst of people. When the trial was happening, I was one of those people. After all, there were many things that made the boys seem guilty. For example, their spending spree, the manner of the killing, the choice of a shotgun versus a handgun. Shotguns do much more damage. The multiple shots and the reloading of the weapons. And let's not forget the lying about the alibi and the cover-up. Those are not the actions of innocent people. But times have changed, and we have learned a lot about how we look at abuse victims. Prior to this murder, the first thing I thought of when a kid kills a parent is that they were abused. The traumatic experiences of childhood sexual abuse can ultimately impair the psychological functioning of the victim at the time the abuse is happening and well into adulthood. As a psychiatric nurse, I worked with adult survivors of child sex abuse as well as adolescents. Their inability to function well in life is profound. In short, The victim's ability to deal with everyday issues as well as complex problems is severely impaired. For them, life is all about survival and it consumes their daily existence. They frequently make bad decisions such as murdering your abuser and they don't think things through to their logical conclusion such as, what do we do now? We've killed them, now what? It's not uncommon for male victims of child sex abuse to repress and deny. They will go to great lengths to not admit to the abuse. Why? They are afraid to be called unmanly. Why couldn't you fight off your father? So rather than admit to that, they simply deny it happened. However, in this case, it's more believable because the brothers reported the abuse earlier in their lives to various relatives. Little boys tend to not make up stories that they're being touched inappropriately. So if they do reveal it, it's a good indicator it's happening, that it's not a lie. A psychiatrist testified in open court that he believed the brothers were abused and that it affected them greatly. The brotherhood of Eric and Lyle Menendez is very complicated. Eric looked up to Lyle. When Lyle was robbing houses with his friends, Eric broke into a house by himself and stole something just to impress Lyle. Lyle admitted in trial number one on the witness stand to abusing his brother Eric when he was younger, and he did the same thing to Eric his father did to him. He took Eric into the woods and used a toothbrush to abuse him. The fact that he took his brother into the woods where they wouldn't be found shows that he knew this kind of activity was something you did in secret. Their father insisted to each of them, demanded, in fact, that they never reveal the abuse to the other brother. I think he did that to maintain control over the secret. When the secret is out of the bag, the abuser loses power. He made the boys feel isolated. The fewer people in the victims' lives, the better. He would not let them go over to friends' houses or have friends over to their house. That way, the secret could be maintained. Jose was also physically abusive. He made Lyle hurt his little brother Eric to teach Eric not to cry. Jose told his son to push on pressure points to really hurt Eric. When he tried to refuse, Jose would hit him. Jose often said, I didn't raise you to be weak because you feel another person's pain. Jose took this even further and did what he called pain training on his younger son. One thing he would do is hold Eric underwater with Eric thrashing about until he would start to lose consciousness. He'd also throw them off a boat and made them swim to shore. The purpose of all of this was to teach them not to cry, to hold their pain in and not express it. Apparently, Jose thought this was just behavior modification. In fact, it was abuse, plain and simple. Nothing good can come of it when a child is treated that way. It causes damage, mistrust, anxiety, and depression. It is teaching your kids to become abusers, or you are teaching them to hate you. Jose abused the boys individually from a young age. At first, the boys thought this was normal for a father to do, because that's what Jose told them. As they got older, they realized that it was wrong. And that's when the shame and guilt set in. 
Shame and guilt are very common feelings among sex abuse victims. After they realize that it's not normal, they think, well, why is this happening to me? Am I bad? As victims get older and push back, that can make things worse. With Jose, that was likely. It's important to point out here, I do not think Jose was a pedophile. That was not why he was having sex with his sons. Not all child molesters are pedophiles. Pedophilia is a condition in which someone is sexually attracted to prepubescent children, and that's all they're attracted to. Molestation is the actual behavior. Someone can have sex with a child and they're not a pedophile, and that's what was happening here. And the reason I think that, not only was Jose married, he had a longstanding mistress in New York, as well as one in Los Angeles, and reportedly was also seeing prostitutes. I think forcing his boys to have sex with him, it wasn't about sex. It was about power, domination, and control. I'm going to do this to you because I can. It was not only their father's abusive behavior in the home that affected the Menendez brothers. Earlier, I mentioned Kitty struggled with alcohol and pills, and she was prone to rages. She talked openly about not wanting to actually be a mother. She reportedly claimed that her own children had ruined her life. It was evident from the family's testimony that Kitty did know about the abuse, that it was occurring, and she turned a blind eye. This often happens in incestuous relationships. It's easier to ignore it than it is to confront it and change the situation. In many cases where the breadwinner of a family is abusing the children, the wife remains silent. Why? Because a wife would be losing everything. If the breadwinner goes to prison, the family falls apart, the money stops coming in, so a lot of mothers simply remain silent. Perhaps it would have been easier for Kitty to come forward and protect her sons if she had her own career and her own money. I can tell you based on 20 years of working with victims as an FBI agent, as well as a psychiatric nurse, a parent who turns a blind eye to abuse cannot expect to have a happy, healthy relationship with their kids down the line. When the victim child grows up and figures things out, they become angry. I am aware of many cases in child sex abuse where the victim never speaks to the other parent again. Kitty was also the victim of abuse when she was a little girl. Her father was very violent, and it was something that she hated. Women that come from abusive environments, sadly, tend to marry men who are abusive, and they stay with them. This contributes to what we call generational abuse. It goes on and on and on. So Kitty did what Kitty knew, subjecting her own children to a variety of cruel and abusive punishments. Kitty was known to have locked Eric in the closet for days when she was unhappy with him. She would give him Tupperware to use as a toilet. One of the cousins testified that he found a Tupperware container in Lyle's room as well, and it was filled with feces. Lyle said he didn't want to disturb his parents at night by having to go to the bathroom. On one occasion, she reached up to Lyle's head and pulled off his toupee in a fit of rage. Until that moment, Eric had no idea his brother even wore a hairpiece. That was also more proof that the brothers didn't really communicate with each other. The parents saw Lyle's hair loss as shameful and embarrassing to them and demanded he cover it up with a toupee. It's indicative of more dysfunction in the family. You're not perfect. I'm ashamed of you. To make a child feel shame about anything regarding their body is horrible. For a child abuse victim, life is all about survival day to day. Is dad going to come in my room tonight? Is dad going to hit me tomorrow? And this causes tremendous problems for a child. It frequently leads to PTSD or post-traumatic stress disorder. This constant level of stress and fear causes an increased release into the system of cortisol and other stress chemicals. Eric definitely suffered from PTSD. He spoke about his first nights in jail actually feeling the safest he had ever felt because he knew he was not going to hear from his father coming down the hall. He could actually sleep through the night. 
I've heard the same thing from other sex abuse victims in prison for murder. The trauma can also impair their ability to think logically. It affects their flight or fight response and can lead to aggressive behavior. The ability to apply reasoning and logic to situations is not there. We see this when the brothers killed their parents. They couldn't think past the killing. They are no longer in survival mode. One problem has been dealt with. Parents are dead and the abuse stops. They couldn't think beyond that. Although it rarely ever happens, children can leave their abusive parents, but most kids feel trapped and that there is no choice. If the boys had gone to the police or the local FBI office, their parents might have been put in jail and then they could have sued them for all their money. But here's the problem with that. When children are abused, their whole life becomes about surviving the abuse and the abuser. They can't leave or believe that they can't leave. When Eric was actually getting ready to go to UCLA, his father validated his worst fear. He told Eric he would not be staying at the dorm every night, but rather coming home. That closed a window of opportunity for Eric to escape. He had seen living in the dorms as a way of getting away, a means to finally be safe. When Jose said that, it was like the floor falling out from underneath him. Jose took away all his hope. If we are to believe Eric's story, this is the final straw. Once again, he is being completely controlled by his father. In their minds, Jose controlled the money. He paid the bills. He had complete power over them at all times. If Jose did threaten him, there was a good chance that Eric was in fear for his life. Based on everything I've learned about this case, I do not think the brothers were mentally ill at all. Were they horrifically abused? Yes. Did this cause irreparable damage to their psyche? Absolutely. The culmination of all the years of physical, sexual, and psychological abuse definitely led up to them killing their parents. But there is no excuse for what they did. I'm just giving possible reasons for why they did it, other than greed. Kids don't kill their parents for no reason. Again, they are not excused from the act of murder, but it does help us understand why such a terrible crime happened. This was premeditated. It was not an act of self-defense. They attacked their parents, and when the mother did not immediately die, they reloaded and shot her again. This is not a crime of passion. This is revenge. Self-defense is an excuse for murdering someone, but only if your life is in imminent danger. Revenge, on the other hand, has been plotted. In this case, they pulled the trigger because that was a way of getting back at their parents, possibly for the abuse or possibly because they were being disinherited. I never interviewed Lyle or Eric. These are my observations from reading and listening to interviews, reviewing case files and court footage. But can I say with certainty that I think the brothers were sexually abused? No. There is no proof that the boys were sexually abused. However, sex abuse is done in private. It's a horrible, horrible crime. There are generally no witnesses to it. I believe Eric's claims of abuse because they rang true with many patients I've treated. And there's no doubt in my mind they were both psychologically and physically abused. Whatever happened, the boys grew up to handle their pain in very different ways. When they finally made a decision to fight back, they unequivocally chose the wrong way. Should they be punished for their actions? Of course. Now, what young people are questioning on social media is whether the punishment truly fit the crime. The Menendez brothers' second trial began eight days after O.J. Simpson's acquittal. The prosecutors treated this as personal. It was felt that the brothers got away with murder in the first trial, and they weren't going to let that happen again. They brought in two new prosecutors who dismissed the abuse claims. The abuse excuse was talked about with derision. It was the 90s, and times were different. The men in the jury had a hard time believing the sexual abuse of the boys by their father. Sometimes jurors hear something that is so horrible that they don't want to believe it. 
I was a teenager when I first heard about sexual abuse by a father of his son, and I didn't believe it. It was incomprehensible to me. It was too horrible. Also, it was not talked about that fathers abuse their sons. Lyle's prosecutor even said, quote, men could not be raped because they lack the necessary equipment to be raped. The ignorance of that statement is staggering. Eric's prosecutor was even worse, suggesting that Eric is a homosexual and that any sexual abuse was actually consensual. Apparently, this prosecutor didn't know that for an adult to have sex with a minor is always a crime. In the second trial, the disdain the prosecutors had for the brothers' stories was even more evident. The prosecution even had a graphic exhibit that said, and I quote, too much tennis, not enough hugs. This would feed into the belief that rich people have no reason to complain about anything. Other than Eric, they were not allowed to speak about the abuse and neither were the witnesses on their behalf. Eric was limited on what he could say. The jury was only given two options, guilty of murder in the first degree or acquittal, and they walk out of court. The judge had decided manslaughter was not on the table. At the end of the second trial, the brothers were both convicted on two counts of murder in the first degree. The jury elected to give them life without parole instead of the death penalty. The sensationalism caused by the trial gained the brothers a lot of attention from women who thought they were very attractive. Both Lyle and Eric are married to women now that they were pen pals with. For 22 years, Eric and Lyle were kept in separate prisons. When they were finally moved into the same prison, they embraced and cried for hours. Eric now spends his time helping terminally ill and physically challenged inmates, while Lyle runs a support group for inmates who have been sexually abused. Lyle has said, I'm the kid that killed his parents, and no river of tears has changed that, and no amount of regret has changed it. I accept that. You are often defined by a few moments in your life, but that's not who you are in your life. You know, your life is your totality of it. The TikTok movement is a groundswell of support. They are really fighting to get the brothers a new trial. Some of them actually feel that the brothers should just be released. With the new information that we have learned about the effects of abuse, would the brothers be able to sway the world to take another look at their case? Well, they got me to do it. The boys are 100% guilty of killing their parents. But is the punishment the correct one for the crime? If you believe that they killed for the money, then absolutely. If you believe it was out of fear for their life, then maybe not. But the truth is usually somewhere in between, and we will have to wait and see where that leads. From Wondery and Treefort Media, this is Killer Psyche. I'm your host, Candace DeLong. This episode was written and produced by Lisa Ammerman and Julie Burke. Edited by Michael Schatz with Maxwell Carney. Our senior audio producer is Tom Monahan. Justin Washington is production manager and Haley Mandelberg is production coordinator. Brandon Clark is our production assistant and the line producer is Oscar Guido. Our executive producers are Kelly Garner and Lisa Ammerman for Treefort and Marsha Louie and Aaron O'Flaherty for Wondery. The series is produced by Wondery and Treefort Media.